You know, some things are so big that you just can't see them. Some things or see them either, follow them, and some so slowly that you have to have more patience than any educator has to teach people to see them. Some things are hard to understand, and some things can't be learned by reading. That's what this film is about, problems in teaching. And all of these problems and many others have existed in education for many years. And teachers everywhere, and teachers of every kind of subject matter have sought the answers. I suspect we're closer to finding the answers today than ever before, simply because more people are thinking about education today than have been thinking about it seriously and motivated by a desire to really do something about it than ever before in the history of our nation. I understand more vividly than ever before that education is something more than a service we owe every young American, that it may be a vital factor in our national survival that brain power is a force that has world significance. This is the most important and most beneficial outcome of all of this talk of critical times in education, that more of us are thinking about it and more of us are looking for ways to improve the techniques of education, teachers and members of the community alike. Of course, as we think about improving techniques characteristically of the world in which we live, we think of using new communications devices with our overloaded teachers and our overloaded curricula, with the many new things there are to teach in a complex society, it makes sense to reach out and employ the new technology. In the sense that inventions are new, films really aren't new. Some kind of motion pictures have been used in American classrooms for many years, and indeed this is one of the great assets of the audio-visual teaching technique and the instructional materials attached to it. They've been around for a long, long time. There's a large body of knowledge, a large body of materials, and a large body of skilled people who've learned to use them and are willing and anxious to teach others to use them. Here in Wilmette, in this Midwestern town where I sit now in my office, I'm surrounded by people who have been making these films for 30 years and who spend their time seeking ways to make the unique contribution that is the goal of the classroom film. A typical problem they face is teaching teachers to teach the questions that young people are asking these days about the newest phenomena of our society, orbits, rockets, satellites. Now, I have on my desk a rocket or a model of a, of a rocket. It's a real rocket. This, as a matter of fact, is a real rocket motor. And if I loaded it and fueled it properly, I could put it into orbit. It's a three-stage rocket. And my failure to get the last two stages apart is probably characteristic of what might happen in many classrooms. But it would be a difficult thing for me to explain to you, sitting here using just this model or genuine rocket, how this rocket came to life, how it might be fired in such a way as to really go into orbit, and what that orbit would look like. I'd have to take your mind's eye to some point in outer space and let you look at the world just as we have learned to do in films with the miracle of animation, let you look at the world and see meaningfully, as we will see in the first clip in this film, what an orbit looks like and what it means when we say a rocket goes into orbit. Suppose there's a tremendously high mountain above the Earth's atmosphere where there's no friction with air. Suppose that on it there's a gun, a shot, will soon be pulled to Earth by gravity, even though its speed is not reduced by air friction. If we use more powder, the shot will travel farther before it's pulled to Earth. But a charge that's just big enough will send the shot just fast enough so that the curve of its drop is exactly the same as the curve of the Earth. Since we've assumed that we're above air friction, speed isn't reduced. Therefore, the shot returns to the point where it was fired with the same speed it started with, and so continues to circle the Earth indefinitely as a satellite. The fuel in the large first stage burns out after about two and a half minutes, sending the rocket very high. Then the first stage is left behind as the second stage takes over. In thinner atmosphere with less gravity, the second stage greatly increases the speed and height of the rocket. 
This stage often contains the guiding devices that put the rocket into the correct path for launching the satellite. Now the nose cone is released. It protected the satellite against the extreme heat of air friction. A motor makes the satellite spin to give it stability. With the rocket at the necessary height, the final stage fires briefly to produce the great speed needed for orbit. The satellite is then ejected, and if all has gone well, it goes into orbit with the rocket casing trailing it. You get some idea of the vexing nature of the teacher's problem when you realize that some things just aren't easy to explain. Try telling a child, for example, that a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. Well, when you ask him next Friday on the quiz, he'll tell you that a caterpillar turns into a butterfly, but the chances are he doesn't know what he's saying and doesn't really understand the process. Here's where the educational filmmaker really gets his best licks in. He uses the magic of time-lapse photography, taking action that takes hours and days, weeks and months, and compressing it into a meaningful few moments. He uses animation and extreme close-up and photomicrography, and he turns an event that can't have meaning unless you personally participate in it and observe it yourself into one that has deep, educational significance. Let's see how he does this in the climactic few seconds from a film called The Monarch Butterfly Story. Watch closely now, for you are about to witness one of nature's grandest dramas. This indescribably beautiful creation was but a few days ago a lowly crawling caterpillar. But now its recreated body is pumping fluid into the veins of wings destined for the glorious freedom of the boundless skies. In about 10 to 15 minutes after its emergence from the chrysalis shell, the wings will be fully expanded. The monarch droops them limply to dry them in the warm rays of the sun. In a few hours, they will be thoroughly dry and stiffened by the hardening of the fluid. At last, it tries its wings and rises with majestic power to frolic in the sunny meadows, to seek the sparkling nectar of the flowers, to add a new generation of beauty to this wonderful world. Now there are some things the eye can't see, some things that are just too small. And here's where the producer of classroom films extends the range of the human eye far beyond its ordinary horizon. On this slide, for example, I have an amoeba. Now you can't see this amoeba and I can't see it either. You couldn't see it if I held it right up against the face of the camera. And students, as a matter of fact, can barely see it with the kind of microscopes they use in the classroom, in classrooms where there are enough microscopes for every student. Magnified 50 or 100 or 120 times, it just doesn't look very big. It also looks quite dead. What does an amoeba look like, alive, magnified 2,000 times its size, and seen in full color? How big, speaking of microscopic life, how big is a one-celled animal? What do one-celled animals look like under the microscope? To deliver this information to the classroom, we asked one of the great microphotographers, Dr. Roman Vishniak, to draw the eye of a needle across the field of his powerful microscopes while his camera recorded the sight in color film. And then we asked him to magnify 2,000 times, living and in color, an amoeba. And that's what you'll see in this next film clip, a sequence from his great film, Protozoa. The amoeba moves simply by streaming from one place to another. The body becomes lengthened into what is called a pseudopod, or false foot. 
the endoplasm streams into the pseudopod. Amoeba, with its pseudopods, forms a major group of protozoa, since protozoa are usually classified by the way in which they move. Now how about dealing with things that are invisible, that our eyes can't see at all, that you can't magnify? You run across these, for example, in the study of the human body, that important aspect of biology where we study ourselves, how to protect and take care of our bodies and maintain our health when we come to understand something about the living process as it affects us. How would you teach sound? How people hear? You can't see sound. You can't see the sound I make as my voice travels through the camera and the soundtrack and the speaker of your projector and into your ear. How do you give a meaningful experience to a young person to whom you're teaching sound? Our cameraman told us that about the only way they could see that this could be done would be to take a camera inside a human head and look out through the ear. This isn't very easy to do with most human heads. But they said if this is the only way you can see the middle ear living. See the eardrum vibrate. See those three bones, the hammer and the anvil and the stirrup, doing whatever it is they do to communicate the sound wave sensation at the eardrum to the brain. With remarkable ingenuity, in a piece of film that's known all around the world and is widely believed to be one of the most effective pieces of teaching film ever made, they did just this in a film called The Ears and Hearing. They matched animation, moving drawings, with this remarkable piece of photography. In this view, we're looking into the middle ear. The semi-transparent membrane vibrating at the lower left is the eardrum. The bones connected with it are the middle ear bones. This is the sound that is causing the eardrum to vibrate. As the eardrum vibrates, it moves the chain of three tiny bones connected with it. These bones are in the middle part of the ear called the middle ear. The largest of the three bones is about one quarter of an inch long. The human body is a good example of the sound motion picture at its best in education. Almost all of it's difficult to understand and difficult to see in action, and certainly difficult to demonstrate in the classroom. How about the human heart? It beats inside of everyone who's watching me. It's beating inside of me. You can't hear it beating and you can't see it. It's a vital part of our complex body mechanism, and it's a complex mechanism in itself. How does it work? How does the heart pump? How does that blood get around? What do we mean when we say the heart is a pump? What do we mean when we talk about heart valves? A valve to a biology student who has never seen a heart valve might be like a faucet in a sink. When you see it in autopsy, it's just a wrinkled, meaningless piece of membrane. But when the camera gets inside the heart and looks out through a valve while the heart is beating, then you understand the function of a valve. And when the skilled animator takes the heart as a pump and with a series of moving drawings shows you just how it functions. Then you have another of the unique experiences that only the classroom film can bring to the teacher in the classroom. Now how about a broader field of biology, leaving the human body and going out into the world, the things that young people see and ask about. Plant life, so important in botany and agriculture and in the subject of biology. How do plants grow? How do they reproduce themselves? Here's a plant in back of me. It's growing as we watch it. And at some point, it will find some way to reproduce itself. Here's a packet of seeds. The key to plant reproduction lies here. These seeds in some way produced by the plant, dispersed by it. Yet they sit in my hand as shriveled, almost meaningless things. And if you planted them in a classroom, you'd need a 24-hour shift to see them turn into a plant and in turn make seeds and disperse those. We made a film about this 20 years ago. And our technological skills in filmmaking have improved, and so we've produced a second edition. Here's another way a film lives forever, in a sense. 
all those old first editions come back to us. Now, with the cameraman's new skills, we make a brand new film and trade it for the old one. Something, by the way, that doesn't happen quite as frequently in libraries and with books. Let's take a look at seed dispersal as the cameraman with his unique skills sees it in the magic of the time-lapse camera. The silky-haired seed of the milkweed is like a parachute. Wind whips it from the plant and sends it sailing away. It may travel a short distance or many miles. Every seed contains a miniature plant or embryo. Now we can watch how the embryo develops. When a plant emerges from a seed, we say it is germinating. We are using a time-lapse camera to watch a bean germinate. Traditionally, teachers have investigated the community by taking their classes on field trips with all their interruptions in routine and discipline and the time that's lost from the teaching process itself. But suppose you wanted to take a class to investigate the health of the community. What one place would you take them to? Where would you go to show them how the many people involved in defending the health of a community work together? This is one of the contributions the filmmaker also delivers to the classroom. He synthesizes time and space and shows within the framework of a few minutes the interrelation of all the people who fight to protect the health of the community. Here, using another one of his skills, the montage, he shows us quickly and effectively within a single moment of a most informative film how the community defends its health. Protecting the health of an entire town requires the work of many people. Volunteer workers in your town may arrange meetings where parents with young children can talk with the town doctors. Here, a mother can see how her child is growing and learn the best ways to keep him healthy. If you are handicapped, you might find that your town has special classes for handicapped children. The town may arrange for chest x-rays, which can detect diseases whose symptoms are hidden to view. The x-ray takes only a few seconds, but it can help to discover certain diseases in their early stages when they are easier to cure. Your town may also provide visiting nurses who go out to homes where people need care for injuries or illness. Well, if you had to, you could frame a series of field trips that would get you around to see the sites involved in studying the health of the community. But when you leave the community and the neighborhood and the town and the area in which you live, then of course the field trip disappears as a possibility. Yet the challenge increases every year to understand the world around us, the other countries, how people live, to get some understanding of the problems people face who live in lands we may never visit in all our lives. These are people we have to deal with in this new kind of global society in which we live. How do you get a class to Peru, to the Andes, to 12,000 feet up in the air? The cameraman does it by visiting it for them, by seeing the community through their eyes, by wandering through the marketplace, into their homes, by studying their activities, by showing children in the United States what a boy in Peru does in school, how he helps his father, how a little girl helps her mother, what a man and a woman do in a family in Peru. Here's just a bit from a film on Peru, made by one of the traveling cameramen who bring these sites back to American classrooms. Every day, the village sheep are herded to the pasture by the lake. At sunset, they are driven back to the village.
Sheep are the greatest source of wealth for the village. Their wool is the most important export of the Indians in southern Peru. In spite of bright sunshine, the mountain people dress in heavy woolen clothing because the mountain air at this height is always cool. Weaving is truly an Indian craft. Indians invented methods of weaving before the arrival of the Spaniard. Their looms are still crude, but their hands are quick and skillful from long practice. Each village takes pride in its original designs and patterns. These change little through the years. The Chambi house is large enough for both the younger and the older members of the family. Ordinarily, the grandparents eat with their children. On sunny days, meals are eaten out of doors. Food consists mainly of boiled potatoes and some cheese. Like most people of these highlands, both the older and younger chumbies chew the flavorful coca leaves. Coca leaves are a mild narcotic which reduces the sensation of hunger or fatigue. So the camera sees beyond the horizon into lands we wouldn't otherwise see. We've seen it look inside of solid objects and view the insides of the human body and make meaningful the processes of nature. What about things that happened long before we were born? Things you otherwise might have to learn about only by reading because they happened so long ago that no one is now alive who can tell you about them. Can the camera turn its eyes back into time? Yes, it can. Here, a whole new range of talents comes into being. The educational film produces ability to recreate in believable form the events in history, those things that happened through man's existence on Earth that bring to us today the tradition which is so meaningful to us, which we have to understand if we understand how the world got this way and where it might go from here on. And here with great skill, the cameraman dresses sets, finds exactly the right costumes, the right artifacts, the right words for skilled actors to say, to give us a chance to live again in the events of historic time. One of the great such experiences is a film made a few years ago by John Barnes, a sensitive producer who went to England to produce an image of the pilgrims for school children all over the world. This isn't the traditional pilgrim film you might imagine, the buckle shoes and the fowling piece over the shoulder and the turkey at Thanksgiving. It gives depth and sensitivity and meaning, not just to the pilgrims and their celebration of Thanksgiving, but to the extent to which man will go to defend his rights, the amount of suffering he can endure for goals he believes in and understands. If we hope to teach tolerance, if we hope to give some sense of what people were willing to suffer to found our country and our traditions, perhaps we have to do it this way. Here is just one scene then from The Pilgrims. Brewster, be warned that the King of England knows of your sins. And we of his, I warrant. <laughs> Enough! You shall disperse to your homes. He shall meet no more, either secretly or in public, to worship in this heretical way. So... You object to your so-called priest wearing clerical garb. <gasps> you object to kneeling when receiving the Holy Sacrament. You object to idolatrous gear and trappings. You object and object, Captain. You well know that we desire above all to have the Word of God freely preached. That you shall not have, Master Brewster. Mark me well. 
The King of England is the supreme authority in matters of religion as well as matters of state. You shall conform to the King's religion. If you do not, he shall harry you out of the land. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. That was moving and enjoyable too. We learned from teachers and from students that learning by film is an enjoyable process, even though the subject matter in itself isn't entertainment. But sometimes the film becomes just a sheer pleasure. This is especially true when it goes into fields of enjoyment, such as music in the arts. You don't think of the motion picture as a way to develop music appreciation. We're accustomed in school to sitting back and listening to records, and in this day of high fidelity, we think perhaps this is the best way to communicate music. Yet let's take a look at how meaningful and how deeply involved you can get personally in a motion picture about music. In the overture to the opera, Marriage of Figaro, the immortal Austrian composer, Mozart, plays the violins and the woodwinds against each other. After that, it's almost a shame for me to have the last word. It's been the film clips in this motion picture that have told the story and told it far more effectively than I can with this illustrated lecture, which is my part of this total presentation. Just as it's always been the films themselves in the hands of alert and interested and forward-looking teachers that have made the great contribution to some of the things we've been able to do in our classroom using modern communications techniques. There's the real message of this film then. These tools have been created. They are available to all peoples everywhere. They have a place in every classroom. They can be made available. Never before in the history of our country has our society turned its back on a challenge to use the modern devices the most advanced techniques to solve its problems. Certainly in education, we have a critical problem. And certainly in education, we will make our greatest contribution to provide to those who deserve the most, our teachers, the tools that help them do the job that's so important to us. <laughs>